And hello, I think we're live. I believe we're live. Um, everything suggests to me that we are live now. Let me just double check and see if the picture's centered. Yeah, roughly, 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 close enough. Anyway, hello, good evening, good morning, good wherever you happen to be. I hope it's a good one kind of a thing. I'm Tad. I'm going to be reading and doing some other talking stuff. Um, and as I get ready to do that, um, what else did I want to tell you about? I don't know. Just stuff. Stuff is always happening. Stuff is all around us. Stuff is universal. And that's kind of all of what my life consists of at the moment is stuff. Um you know, all the usual stuff, but also some interesting stuff in the sense of interesting to me personally, getting near the end of the, the book. Things are in the navigator's children are beginning to fall into place, so that's all exciting. Um it also means for me, working on these complicated books, it, they're they're very much like, um, I always call them thumb puzzles. I think they're also sometimes called tile puzzles, but they're the little square puzzles that have little plastic tiles with numbers on them. And you, you can, there's only one open space, so you can only have one sliding into an open space at a time, and you try and gradually put all the numbers in order. And that's pretty much what plotting um, and writing a complicated book is like. Because as you get down toward the end, there's increasingly fewer places that you can have things happen and increasingly fewer chances. And when you multiply that times the fact that only certain characters are in position to see certain things or to know certain things so that you know, they are explained or reminded uh, to the readers or whatever. Um, you know, so if you have a character show up who hasn't been in for a while and, you know, you, you want someone to recognize them to remind the reader that about that character quickly, um, then you need to have a character who can do that, who has been established to do that in the story in place. But as I said, as you get down to the end of a complicated story, it's um, more, everything becomes more and more rigid. You know, the puzzle becomes harder and harder to move pieces around because you've already committed to certain things, committed to certain characters being in certain places, committed to things happening in a certain order. And um, so that's, it's a very interesting part of the book. And that's what I'm working on now. I'm working on what I would call the penultimate climax of the story, because um, there's really two major plot nodes that are going to come together. Actually, there's three with this one now that I think about it, but two of them are very action-oriented, and one of them is less so. So um, I'm in one of the, I'm in the penultimate, the second to the last um, action everything's happening at once different characters are seeing different things and at the same at the same moment the story is being the larger issue is being pushed forward through all these different viewpoints with occasional backtracks and overlaps and i don't know it's hard to explain but it's it's really interesting to work on so that's what i'm doing meanwhile of course chaos exists all around um we have finally had a major breakthrough <laughs> in our private life, in our home or domestic life, which is that we now have the fences fixed again so that we can put the large dog out into the yard or even better, just sometimes just like let open a door and let them run in and out as they choose. Small dog is not that interested in going. I mean, he likes to get out. Don't get me wrong, but what all he really wants to do most of the time is go two or three feet outside the, the, the door and lie in the sun. Whereas Big Dog, Big Dog wants to roam the property and protect um, us from all the many menaces that exist. I hope I've just lost my focus again. Um, seems to seem to happen when I moved away. Let's see if I can get it to see my hands and then get the focus back. Um, but anyway, so it's, it's, it's rather amusing because the, um, the big dog is, is he really wants to behave well, but he's kind of, uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for? He's kind of compelled. He's kind of got a compulsion about getting out. He hates it, you know, if he's out for very long. And he actually got hit by a car one of the times he got out. So he's got all kinds of conflicts built into this whole thing of trying to get out. But he still will try. Um, the good thing is, is that he tries so quickly that you very, very fast find out if the, the solutions that you've come up with are going to work or not. Like, you know, we made a new fence to block off a certain part of the yard for him. And, you know, we're, Deb and I are sitting out tonight just, you know, watching the, the sun go down and listening to the birds and stuff as we tend to in the evenings and, and talk and, you know, hang out. And um, I hear this repeated clunk, 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 and, and uh, Deb says, what's that? And I said, oh, it's probably Johnny trying to get through the new fence. And fortunately, this new fence is an internal fence, um, not an external one that leads off the property if he could get through it. So he, I hear clunk, clunk for a while, and then I hear silence. And then there's Johnny. He's gotten out of the internal fence that we just built and is now, you know, in the other part of the yard that we were trying to keep him out of. And uh, so I went back and realized that it was not a real heavy duty latch on the gate and he figured out how to lift it with his nose. So it's, it's currently heavily bungee corded. Um, I think most Europeans know what a bungee cord is, I, although there may be a different name bicycle cord I, no not that's not right but anyway it's the cord with plastic hooks at the end and it's very stretchy and you use it to wrap things onto the back of your bike or you know stuff like that um, so that gate is now heavily bungeed until I can come up with a more permanent solution so on the one hand he drives me mad on the other hand at least he's consistent in the sense that he does these things right away so that I know <laughs> You know, instead of being clever enough to wait until I go away and then do it and get out or something, you know, he, he just goes right away. Oh, I can figure this out and does so. Anyway, what else is going on? Um, our young ones are moving up beginning of next week to their new home. So I will probably be out of town for a couple of days while we're helping them move in. Um, but that will be, you know, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and so it won't have any effect on readings. Um, let me think, anything else? We will have people staying in the house with the dogs, so any of you burglars, be aware, Johnny, <laughs> well, large dog Johnny, part Mastiff Johnny, will still be here. And <clears throat> he will have realized now that I've bungeed the gate, so he'll be especially cranky. So not only does he protect us from night bunnies and murder squirrels and uh, freelance burglars of many kind, but intruders in general. So I wouldn't come to the house. Not only will we have people here, but there will be a large grumpy Johnny too. Um, anything else that I need to tell you guys about? I don't think so. I don't think there's been that much. I mean, there's been a lot happening domestically, but not much of it, unless you guys are really interested in painting banisters, you know, and stuff like that. Um, which, you know, we are because it's our house. So, you know, we're like walking around going, wow, it looks so different now that the banisters are painted. <laughs> Not inside banisters, the outside ones on the deck. Anyway, so I'm going to say hello to people. And then I am going to probably just start reading. Oh, look at that. I've lost my focus again. I got to get a new webcam. This thing is just not really doing what it should do. Um, anyway, so let me see who's checked in and say hello to everybody. First up is Mark checking in from, well, usually checking in from Yorkshire. I don't know where Mark's checking in from this time. So good morning, good morning. Ronnie, good to see you. Suzanne, good morning. Anamika, good morning, good morning. Everything is fine. No complaints here. Um, everything is, uh, is quite fine, quite happy, quite nice. Um certainly compared to how some things have been in the last few months when they were overwhelming and exhausting. Um, at the moment, they're pretty good. Um, so let me see who else. Chris, hello. Good morning to you, Chris. Good to see you, Wouter. Hello, hello. Um, already too warm in the Netherlands. Yeah, we, we finally started having a few hot days here, but I'm sure it's been worse in, in Europe. Um, it's also been worse in parts of the United States, not surprisingly. It's one of the reasons, actually, that we decided to stay here where we are because we were really kind of thinking about 
you know, maybe it was time to move or whatever for a number of reasons, um, and decided that, you know, one of the many things about it is living near the ocean moderates the temperatures quite a bit. And as I've miserated about at length in other broadcasts, I've, I'm have i very Northern European in my genetic makeup, and I am not good with a lot of sun. It's the only thing that really kind of keeps me from be being able to work because it keeps me from being able to think. So, I mean, other than obvious other things like serious pain or being very sick or something, but uh, in the normal span of life, it's only heat that really undermines my ability to write books. Anyway, Mahmoud, hello, good to see you. Just checking in from holiday in Turkey. Oh, good. Glad to hear you've had a, had a holiday. I hope it was a nice time. Ilva, mm, I'm sorry to hear it's so hot where you are too. Anyway, I will try to be very distracting. I will, you know, in, endeavor to do something interesting, explode or something. Um, wada, 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 wada. Yeah, <laughs> Vouter points out, don't talk about the fence in, fence in terms of breakthroughs. No, good point. Maria Jose, hello, hello, good to see you. Cliff, a pleasure as always. Oh yeah, writers with drinks. I've done writers writers with drinks. That's a that's a very nice uh, get together. Um, I assume Charlie Jane is still doing it, um, and Charlie is excellent value always. Um, who else have we got? Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Spangumi. Oh, okay. So Chris says that in. Germany, I guess it's called Spangumi. That's what we call a um, bungee cord. That's what we call a bungee cord, is a Spangumi. Um, I, gumi, I know, can mean like rubber, I think, and uh, coming originally from the gum tree. Um, span, I assume, is meaning to stretch, meaning stretch or whatever. Um, also, obviously, it's means bridge as well or it has a its root is in the same word as the span meaning bridge anyway hello who else have we got here tom hello hello greetings sonia hello hello good to see you too tom says that he is just back from sicily that was hot the hottest you know kind of two week period i've ever spent or week and a half or whatever it was is some years back my parents as a kind of family thing they cashed in some checks or something or check cashed in some stock or did something. And they said they wanted to have a family get together, um, which, you know, oh, and actually do it in Europe, which we had done once before, like 20 something years earlier. And so they rented a, a, a little kind of rundown villa in Sicily. And we were all really excited. And of course, we all went to go meet there. This everyone, meaning my my brothers, their spouses, their kids, you know, we all went and my parents. And uh, it was the hottest, like, 10 days. This was, I don't know what now, six years ago, seven, eight years ago. Uh, you could probably look it up. At the time, it was the hottest summer they'd ever had in Sicily, and it was just cruel. So, Tom, you have my sympathies. I have been in a hot Sicily when I was there on vacation, and, and I really lo I love Italy. I love Sicily. I, you know, we were there. We wanted to see... You know, the uh, we were near Sy Syracuse, Syracuse, so we wanted to see, you know, the Archimedean stuff and all kinds of other stuff. And we did see as much as we could, and we did take advantage of the place while we were there, but we could have done twice as much if it was not so bloody hot. It was just horrifying. Um, okay, so let me think. Da, 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 da. Jeremy, Jonathan, who is Jeremy's brother, says, finally, the Williamses have aligned watching John Williams in Berlin on PBS and Tad Williams here. What a night. Williamses, as far as the eye can see. It's Williamses all the way down. Anyway, uh, Savoca and Taormina is where Tom went to, and that sounds really good. Sorry, this Sunday is family time, says Holger. Well, shame on you for having a family and trying to give them some of your time. What kind of crazy person are you? Um, you should definitely be hanging out with me, a foreign person far away, online, um, than hanging out with your family. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Anyway, lovely to see you, however briefly, Holger. Always a pleasure. So, 
Um, I think I, there wasn't. Yeah, I mean, oh, and I signed a whole bunch of books. That was yesterday. Um, signed a whole book, bunch of books for Sean um, Speakman and who is Grim Oak Press and Grim Oak Books and all that. And, and a, a great guy. And he was here, came, drove down with his wife, Kristen. And um, Sean's also a writer uh, besides being, you know, a, a, in the publishing business and the book selling business. He is also a writer himself and a very good one. And he and his wife, Kristen, and their two kids came down. And I had his younger son, Kale, on my lap, their younger son, Kale, on my lap at the after the last half an hour after dinner, um, looking at pictures of owls and banana slugs. And it was so, it's been a long time, you know, since my kids were that small and that wiggly, you know, and, and but it, but in the nicest possible way, you know, just like they're squirming, changing position, climbing, you know, up, down, all around and, and, you know, but, and carrying on, Kale is like three, I think, and carrying on this just nonstop monologue, half of which is not audible because you're in a restaurant with a bunch of other people. And because kids, especially kids that age, aren't pitching their voice toward you or trying to, you know, they're just doing their thing. They're just talking about things. So I was having these hilarious conversations with my new three-year-old friend who was, you know, like telling me these really important things about, you know, the carved wooden birds we were looking at or, you know, the owls or the, you know, different other things that I would say, oh, well, do you know what this is? Let's look at it. Let's find a picture of this. And, and he had all these things to say and I could only hear a small part of it, but it was so reminiscent because, of course, both my kids were great talkers both our biological kids were great talkers at that age too and um, you would have these insane conversations with them which were quite charming you know and and it was great fun having a small kid well this is not to to denigrate Sean and Kristen's other kid who's a really cool kid named Soren but Soren's like six so he basically at a certain point he went these are old people. They're boring. You know, my parents, eh, you know, I don't need to talk to them either. And he was like busy working on his Star Wars coloring book or something along those lines. So he was quite self-contained and happy. Lovely kid, too. Anyway, so that's about the only things I've done of note lately, other than work. Other than work. And there's been quite a bit of the work, I am glad to say because I always feel better when I've done some work. I always feel like my existence is justified. Um, I don't any longer have to apologize for taking up space. Um, you know, I, I feel as though I can then slack off for a certain portion of my day because I have done work and I can prove it. As if anybody's asking me, because I'm, I'm my own boss. That's the saddest thing. Um, this is like a cliche, but it's so true. I am the worst boss I ever had. No boss I ever had would have dared to make me work seven days a week. I had a few who had me working six days a week, especially when I was, you know, 17, 18, just entering the workforce. But none of them would have dared demand that I work seven days a week. But my current boss, who happens to be me, is a bastard. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Okay, so... We are going to return to the Dragon Bone Chair. We are in Chapter 7, The Conqueror Star. Old King John has died and has been put in his, his barrow on top of Swert Cliff outside of the Hayholt and the, the, the hilly highland upland beside the Hayholt. And um, Simon is trying to get Morganes to teach him some magic, which is what Simon thinks Morganes does. And Morganes is saying, whoa, slow down there. And then Simon's going, well, how about Pyrates? Pyrates, you know, everybody knows that Pyrates does magic. And Morganes basically tells him, you don't want to be like Pyrates, trust me. And so then we had started another scene that begins with is Grimner and um, Joshua. Duke is Grimner of Rimmer's Guard and Prince Joshua, the new king's younger brother, um, dueling with wooden swords, with practice swords. So, 
Joswa sat up, shading his eyes. Two figures were approaching across the yellow grass of the tourney field. One was draped in a long robe. It is hot, Joswa said. And in Novanda, as Grimner grunted, pulling off the dueling vest. The days of the hound are long behind us, and still there's by the mother heat. Where is the rain? Frightened away, perhaps. Joshua squinted at the two figures as they drew nearer. Oh, my young brother, one of the two figures called, and old Nuncle is Grimner. Looks like you have worn yourselves out at your play. Joshua and the heat have damn near killed me, your majesty, as Grimner called out as the king approached. Elias was garbed in a rich tunic of sea green. Dark-eyed Priorates walked at his side in flapping red robe, a comradely scarlet bat. Joshua stood, extending his hand to his Grimner as the older man clambered to his feet. Duke is Grimner, as usual, exaggerates, the prince said softly. I was forced to knock him to the ground and sit on him, to save my own life. Yes, yes, we were watching your... Horse playing from Yeldon's tower, Elias said, waving a careless hand back to where the tower's bulk loomed over the hayhole's outwall. Weren't we, Pyrates? Yes, sire. Pyrates' smile was thin as thread, his voice a dry rasp. Your brother and the duke are mighty men indeed. Uh, by the way, your majesty, his grimner said, may I ask you about something? I hate to trouble you with state business at such a time. Elias, who had been staring out across the field, turned to the old duke with a look of mild annoyance. I am, as it happens, discussing some important matters with Pyrates. Why do you not come to see me when I am holding court on such things? He turned back again. Across the tourney field, Guthwolf and Count Eolair of Nad Molach a kinsman of Hernestir's King Luth, were chasing a fractious stallion that had broken its traces. Elias laughed at the sight and elbowed Pyrates, who favored him with another perfunctory smile. I... Your pardon, Majesty, his Grimner resumed, but I have been trying to take this matter up with you for a fortnight. Your Chancellor, Helfkin, keeps telling me that you're too busy. At Yeldon's tower, Joshua added. For a moment the brothers locked eyes, then Elias turned to the duke. Oh, very well then, what is it? It's the royal garrison at Vesvenby. They have gone for a well over a month now and remain unreplaced. The Frost March is still a wild place, and I do not have enough men to keep the northern Weldhelm road open without the Vestvenby garrison. Will you not send another troop? Elias had returned his gaze to Guthwolf and Aelair, two small figures shimmering in the heat as they chased the diminishing stallion. He answered without turning. Scully of Coldscrike says that you have more than enough men, old uncle. He says you are hoarding your soldiers at Elvritsala, and Narved. Why is that? His voice was deceptively light. Before the startled as Grimner could reply, Joshua spoke up. Scully's sharp nose is a liar if he says that. You are a fool if you believe him. Elias whirled, his lip curling. Is that right, Brother Joshua? Scully is a liar. And I should take your word for that. You, who have never tried to hide your hatred of me. Now then, now then, is Grimner interrupted, flustered and more than a little frightened. Elias, your majesty, you know, you, you know my loyalty. I was the firmest friend your father ever had. Oh, yes, my father, Elias snorted. And... Please do not take your displeasure over these scandalous rumors, for that is all they are. 
out on Jaswa. He does not hate you. He is as loyal as I am. Of that, said the king, I have no doubt. I shall garrison Vestvenby when I am ready to, and not before. For a moment Elias stared at them both, eyes wide. Pryrates, long silent, reached up a white hand to tug at Elias's tunic sleeve. Please, my lord, he said, this is not the time or place for such things. He flicked an impudent, heavy-lidded glance at Joshua. Or so I humbly submit. The king stared at his minion and nodded once. You are right. I have allowed myself to become angered over nothing. Forgive me, uncle, he said to his grimner. For as you said, it is a hot day. Forgive my temper, he smiled. His grimner bobbed his head. Of course, sire. It is easy to let ill humors get the best of us in such stifling weather. It is strange this late in the year, is it not? That it is. Elias turned and grinned broadly at the red-cloaked priest. Pryrates here for all his holy standing in the church cannot seem to convince God to give us the rain we are praying for. Can you, counselor? Pryrates looked at the king strangely, ducking his head back into the collar of his robe like an albino tortoise. Please, m my lord, he said, let us resume our talk and leave these gentlemen to their sword play. Yes, the king nodded. I suppose so. As the pair began to move off, Elias stopped. He wheeled slowly around to face Joshua, who was picking the wooden practice swords up from the dry grass. You know, brother, the king said, it has been a long time since the two of us crossed staves. Watching you has put me in mind of those old times. What do you say we make a few passes as long as we are all here upon the field? A quiet moment passed. As you wish, Elias, Joshua replied at last, and tossed one of the wooden blades to the king who caught the hilt deftly in his right hand. As a matter of fact, Elias said, a half-smile playing across his lips, I don't believe we have engaged since your accident. He put on a look of greater solemnity. Lucky for you, it was not your sword-wielding hand that was lost. Lucky indeed. Joshua measured himself a pace and a half, then turned to face Elias. On the other hand, Elias began, Ah, that was a poor choice of words, wasn't it? My apologies. Alternately, it is unlucky that we must fence with these poor wooden oars. He waggled the practice sword. I do so and watch, enjoy watching you use... What do you call that thin blade of yours? Ah, Nidel. It is a pity you do not have it here. Without warning, Elias leaped forward, swinging a hard backhand toward Joshua's head. The prince caught the blow, allowing it to slide by, then thrust forward. Elias trapped the oncoming lunge and deftly turned it aside. The two brothers backed apart, circling. Yes. Joshua leveled his sword before him, his thin face slick with sweat. It is too bad that Nidel is not with me. It is also too bad that you do not have bright nail. The prince made a swift downward cut and slid into another looping thrust. The king backpedaled swiftly, then counterattacked. Bright nail, said Elias, breathing a little heavily. What do you mean by that? You know that it it is buried with our father. He ducked an arching backhand and pushed Joshua back. Oh, I know, said Joshua, parrying. But a king's sword, just like his kingdom, should be wisely a thrust and proudly a counter-thrust. 
should be wisely and carefully used by his heir. The two wooden blades slid together with a noise like an axe cleaving timber. The pressure moved down until the hilts locked together, and Elias and Joshua's faces were merely inches apart. Muscles bunched beneath the brothers' shirts. For a moment they were nearly still, the only movement a slight trembling as they strained against each other. Finally, Joshua, who could not grip his hilt with two hands as the king could, felt his blade begin to slide. With a supple shrug, he disengaged and sprang backward, lowering the blade before him again. As they faced each other across the expanse of grass, chests heaving, a loud, deep tolling rang out across the tourney field, the bells of Green Angel Tower marking the noontide. "'There you are, gentlemen!' cried his Grimner, a sickly smile on his face. There had been no mistaking the naked hatred that flowed between the two. "'There are the bells, and that means dinner time. Shall we call it a draw? If I don't get out of the sun and find a flag and a wine, I'm afraid I won't make it to Aden Manza this year. These old northern bones weren't meant to stand such cruel heat. The duke is right, my lord, Pryrates rasped, laying his hand on Elias's wrist, which still held the upraised sword. A reptilian smile tightened the priest's lips. You and I can finish our business as we walk back. Very well, Elias grunted, and tossed the shoulder over, tossed the sword, and tossed the sword over his shoulder, where it struck the ground and cartwheeled once, then fell flat. Thank you for the exercise, brother. He turned and offered his arm to Pryrates. They moved away, scarlet and green. "'What do you say, Joshua?' his Grimner asked, taking the wooden sword from the prince's hand. "'Shall we go and have some wine?' "'Yes, I suppose so,' Joshua replied, bending to pick up the vests as his Grimner retrieved the sword the king had flung away. He straightened, staring into the distance. "'Do the dead always stand between the living, uncle?' he asked quietly then drew his hand across his face. Never mind you. Let us go and find some place cool. Really, Judith, it's all right. Rachel won't mind. Simon's questing hand was captured mere inches away from the mixing bowl. Judith's grip, for all her pinkness and plumpness, was quite strong. Get on with you. Rachel wouldn't mind, indeed. Rachel would break every bone in this frail old body of mine. Pushing Simon's hand back into his lap, Judith blew a strand of hair out of her eyes and wiped her fingers on her stained apron. I should have known that the merest whiff of the Aidentide bread of bacon would bring you round like an Innescrick camp dog. Simon traced sad patterns in the flower-strewn counter. But, Judith, you've got mounds and mounds of dough. Why can't I have a taste from the bowl? Judith levered herself up from the stool and moved gracefully to one of the kitchen's hundreds of shelves, like a barge on a placid river. Two young scullions scattered before her like startled seagulls. Now where, she mused, where is that crock of sweet butter? As she stood finger to mouth in a thoughtful pose, Simon edged nearer to the mixing bowl, mixer bowl. Don't you dare, laddie! Judith cast the words over her shoulder without even turning to look at him. Did she have eyes on all sides? It's not that there's not enough dough to spare, Simon. Rachel doesn't want you spoiling your supper. She continued her perusal of the orderly shelves stacked with goods as Simon sat back and glowered. Despite the occasional frustrations, the kitchen was a fine place. Longer even than Morgenis' chambers, it seemed nevertheless small and intimate, 
full of the pulsing warmth of the ovens and the scents of good things. Lamb stew seethed in iron pots. Aidentide breads were rising in the oven, and papery brown onions hung like copper bells in the fogged window. <coughs> the air was thick with the smells of spices, tangy ginger and cinnamon, saffron, cloves, and scratchy pepper. Scullions rolled barrels of flour and pickled fish through the door or pulled loaves from the baking ovens with flat wooden paddles. One of the chief apprentices was boiling rice paste over the fire in a pot of almond milk, making a blanche sweet for the king's dessert. And Judith herself, a huge, gentle woman, who made the giant kitchen seem as intimate as a farmer's cot, directed all without once raising her voice, a kindly but sharp-eyed sovereign in her kingdom of bricks and pots and firelight. She returned with the missing crock, and as Simon regretfully watched, she took a long-handled brush and dabbed the butter over the braided Aidentide loaves. Judith, Simon asked at last, if it's almost Aiden Manza, why is there no snow? Morgane said he's never seen it wait this late in the year. That I don't know, I'm sure, Judith said briskly. We had no rain in November either. I expect it's just a dry year. She frowned and brushed again at the nearest loaf. They've been watering the sheep and cows from the town in the Hayholt moat, Simon said. Have they, then? Yes. You can see the brown rings around the edges where the water's gone down. There are places you can stand where the water doesn't even reach your knees. And you found them all, I don't doubt. I think so, Simon replied proudly. And last year, this time, it was all frozen. Think of it. Judith looked up from her loaf glazing to fix Simon with her pale, kind blue eyes. I know it's exciting when things like this happen, she said, but just remember, laddie, we need that water. There'll be no more fine meals if we get neither rain nor snow. You can't drink the Kinslaw, you know. The Kinslaw, because of the Glenowent that fed it, was nearly as salty as the sea. I know that. Simon said. I'm sure it will snow soon, or rain, since it's so warm. It's just that it will be a very strange midwinter. Judith was about to say something else when she stopped, looking over Simon's shoulder at the doorway. Yes, girl, what is it? she asked. Simon turned to see a familiar curly-haired serving girl standing a few feet away. Hepzibah. "'Rachel sent me to find Simon, Mum,' she replied, giving a lazy half-curtsy. "'She needs him to get something down from a high shelf.' "'Well, dearie, you don't need to ask me. "'He's just sitting here, mooning over my baking, "'not being any help or anything.' "'She made a shooing gesture at Simon. "'He did not see it, as he was admiring Hepzibah's tight-cinched apron.' and the wavy hair which her cap could neither control nor can contain. Lizzie's, Lizzie's mercy, girl. Boy, get on with you. Judith leaned over and poked him with the handle of the brush. Hepzibah had already turned and was nearly out the door. As Simon scrambled down off his stool to follow, the kitchen mistress laid a warm hand on his arm. Here, she said, I seem to have spoiled this one. See, it's all crooked. She handed him a loaf of warm bread, twisted like a piece of rope, and smelling of sugar. "'Thank you,' he said, tearing off a piece and pushing it into his mouth as he hurried to the door. "'It's good!' "'Of course it is!' Judith called after him. "'If you tell Rachel, I'll skin you!' By the time she had finished, she was shouting at an empty doorway. It only took a few paces before Simon caught up with Hepzibah, who was not walking very quickly. Was she waiting for me? He wondered, feeling oddly breathless, then decided it was more likely that anyone given an errand which took them from out of Rachel's clutches would dawdle all they could. Would you... 
Would you like some of this? He asked, gasping slightly. The serving girl took a piece of the sweet bread and sniffed it, then popped it into her mouth. Oh, that's good, that is, she said, then gifted Simon with a dazzling smile, eyes crinkling at the corners. Give me another, won't you? He did. They passed out of the hall and into the courtyard. Courtyard. Hepzibah crossed her arms as if to hug herself. Ooh, that's cold, she said. It was actually fairly warm, blazing hot, considering it was Decander month. But now that Hepzibah had mentioned it, Simon was sure that he could detect a breeze. Yes, it, it is cold, isn't it? he said, and fell silent again. As they walked past the corner of the inner keep that housed the royal residences, Hepzibah pointed up to a small window just below the upper turret. See there, she asked. Just the other day, I saw the princess standing there, combing her hair. Oh my, but hasn't she got nice hair? A dim memory of gold catching the afternoon sunlight floated up in Simon's mind, but he was not to be distracted. Oh, I, I think you have much nicer hair, he said, then turned away to look at one of the guard towers in the middle bailey wall, a treacherous blush stealing up his cheeks. Do you really? laughed Hepzibah. I think it's the worst tangle. Princess Miriamel has ladies to brush hers. Sarah, you know her, the fair-haired girl, knows one of them. Sarah says that this lady told her the princess is very sad sometimes, and that she wants to go back to Merriment, where she grew up. Simon was looking with great interest at Hepzibah's neck, wreathed by the sprays of curly brown hair that hung down from her cap. Hmm, he said. You want to know something else? Hepzibah asked, turning away from the tower. What are you staring at? she squealed but her eyes were merry. Stop it! I told you my hair was in a strew. Do you want to know something else about the princess? What? Her father wants her to marry Earl Fingbald, but she doesn't want to. The king is very angry with her, and Fingbald is threatening to leave the court and go back to Falshire. Although why he'd want to do that, who knows? Lufsanu says... He never will, since no one in his earldom has enough money to appreciate his horses and clothes and things. Who's Lofsanu? Simon wanted to know. Oh, Hepzibah looked coy. He's a, a soldier, I know. He's with Count Breugar's household force. He's very handsome. The last of the Aden tide bread turned to wet ashes in Simon's mouth. A soldier, he said quietly. Is he a relative of yours? Hepzibah giggled, a sound that Simon was beginning to find a little irritating. A relative? <laughs> Merciful Reup, no, I should say not. Mooning after me all the time. She giggled again. Simon liked it even less. Maybe you've seen him, she continued. He's a guard and the eastern barracks. Big shoulders and a beard. She sketched in the air a man in whose shadow two Simons could comfortably have sat on a summer day. Simon's feelings were at war with his more sensible nature. His feelings won. Soldiers are stupid. He grunted. They are not, said Hepzibah. You take that back. Losuno is a fine man. Some day he's going to marry me. Well, you'll make a fine couple. <coughs> Simon snarled, then felt sorry. I hope you'll be happy, he finished, hoping that the reasons for his resentment were not as crystallinely clear as he felt sure they were. Well, we will be, said Hepzibah, mollified. She stared at a pair of yeoman warders walking on the battlements above their heads, long pikes couched on their shoulders. 
Some day, Lufsanu will be a sergeant, and we shall have a house of our own in Urchester. We'll be happy as, as can be. Happier than that poor princess, anyway. Grimacing, Simon picked up a round stone and rattled it off the bailey wall. Dr. Morganes, pacing the battlements, looked down as Simon and one of the young serving girls passed beneath him. A dry breeze blew his hood back from his head as the couple passed below. He smiled and silently wished Simon good luck. The boy appeared to need it. His awkward carriage and bouts of sullenness made him seem more child than man, but he had the height and showed the promise of growing into it some day. Simon was straddling the borderline, and even the, even the doctor, whose age no one in the castle now could guess, remembered what that was like. There was a sudden whirring of wings in the air behind him. Morgenes turned, but slowly, as if it was no surprise. Anyone watching would have seen a fluttering gray shadow that hung in the air before him for the span of a few heartbeats, then disappeared into the spacious folds of his gray sleeves. The doctor's hands, which had been empty a moment earlier, now held a small roll of fine parchment bound with a slender blue ribbon. Cupping it in one, one palm, he unrolled it with a gentle finger. The message upon it was in the southern tongue of Naban and the church, but the letters were stark Rimmersgard runes. Morgan, the fires of Stormspike have been lit. From Tungledia I have seen their smokes nine days and their flames eight nights. The white foxes are awake again, and in the darkness they trouble the children. I have also sent winged words to our smallest friend, but I doubt they will find him unawares. Someone has been knocking at dangerous doors. Signed, Yanauga. Beside the signature, the author had drawn a crude feather in a circle. Odd weather is it not, a dry voice said. And yet so pleasant for walking on the battlements. The doctor whirled, crumpling the parchment in his hand. Pyrates stood at his shoulder, smiling. The air is full of birds today, the priest said. Are you a student of birds, doctor? Do you know much of their habits? I have some small knowledge of them. Morganes said quietly. His blue eyes were narrowed. I myself have thought of studying them, Pyrates nodded. They are easily captured, you know, and they hold so many secrets that the inquiring mind would find valuable. He sighed and rubbed his smooth chin. Ah, well, merely another thing to consider. My time is so full already. Good day, doctor. Enjoy the air. He moved off down the battlement, boots clicking on the stone. For a long while after the priest had gone, Morgane stood quietly, staring at the blue-gray northern sky. Chapter 8. Bitter Air and Sweet it was late in the month of John Ever. The rains had still not come. As the sun began to sink behind the western walls, and insects gossiped in the tall, dry grass, Simon and Jeremiah's the Chandler's boy sat back to back and panting. Come on, then, Simon forced himself to his feet. Let's have another go. Jeremiah, now unsupported, slumped backward until he lay outstretched in the scratchy, scratchy grass like an upended turtle. You go on, he wheezed. I'll never be a soldier. Of course you will, said Simon, annoyed at such talk. We both will. You were much better last time. Come on, get up. 
With a groan of pain, Jeremiah allowed himself to be tugged upright. He reluctantly took the barrel stave Simon's handed to him. Let's go in, Simon. I hurt all over. You think too much, Simon responded and lifted his own stave. Have at you! Stave smacked on stave. Ow! Simon yelped. Ha ha! Chortled Jeremiah, much heartened. A moral blow! The clicking and smacking resumed. It had not been just his unsuccessful flirtation with Hepzibah that reawakened Simon's old fascination with the glories of the military life. Before Elias had come to the throne, Simon had felt sure that his true desire, the one for which he would, have, he would give anything, was to be Morgenes' apprentice and to learn all the secrets of the doctor's muddled, magical world. But now that he had it, and had replaced plodding Inch as the doctor's helper, the glory had begun to pale. There was so much work, for one thing, and Morgenis was so damnably rigorous about everything. And had Simon learned to do any magic at all? He had not. Placed against hours of reading and writing and sweeping and polishing in the doctor's dark chamber, Great deeds on the battlefield and the admiring glances of young women were not to be sneered at. Deep in Jacob the Chandler's tallow-scented den, fat Jeremiah had also been caught up in the martial splendor of the king's first year. During the week-long pageants that Elias seemed to hold virtually every month, all the color of the realm settled on the jousting lists. The knights, like shiny butterflies of silk and gleaming steel, far more beautiful than any mortal thing. The glory-spiced wind that blew across the tournament field awakened deep longings in the breasts of young men. Simon and Jeremiah went to the cooper for long slats to fashion into swords, just as they had in childhood. They traded blows together for hours after chores were finished, at first staging their mock battles in the stables until Shem Horsegroom threw them out for the peace of his wards, then moving to the unmowed grass just south of the tourney field. Night after night, Simon came limping back to the servants' quarters, breeches snagged and shirt torn, and Rachel the dragon turned up her eyes and prayed aloud for St. Reup to save her, from the block-headedness of boys, then rolled up her sleeves and added some bruises to those Simon had already garnered. I think, Simon puffed, that's enough. Jeremiah's pink-faced and doubled over could only nod his agreement. As they trooped back toward the castle in the fading light, sweating and huffing like plow oxen, Simon noted with approval that Jeremiah was beginning to lose some of his lumpishness. Another month or so, and he would begin to resemble a soldier. Before their regular dueling began, he had looked more like something his master might put a wick into. That was a good day today, wasn't it? Simon asked. Jeremiah rubbed his head through his cropped hair and gave Simon a look of disgust. I don't know how you talk me into this he rumbled. They will never let folk like us be anything but cook-fire boys. B -b but on the field of battle, anything can happen, Simon said. You might save the king's life from Thrithing's men or Naraxi raiders and, and be knighted on the spot. Hmm. Jeremiah was not impressed. And how are we going to get them to take us in the first place? with no families, nor horses, nor swords even. He waggled his stave. Yes, said Simon. Well, well, then I'll, I'll think of something. Hmm, agreed Jeremiah, and mopped his flushed face with the hem of his tunic. The flare of torchlight sprang up before them in a score of places as they neared the castle walls. What had been open, grassy space in the shadow of the Hayholt's outwall was now an infestation of wretched huts and tents 
piled together and overlapping each other like the scales of an old sick lizard. The grass was long gone, cropped to the soil by sheep and goats, as the ragged shanty dwellers milled about, setting up their campfires for the night and calling their children in ahead of the darkness. The dust kicked into gritty plumes that swirled briefly before settling, dyeing clothes and tent fabric alike a dusky gray-brown. "'If it doesn't rain soon,' said Jeremiah, frowning at a pack of shrieking children who tugged at the faded garments of a faded-looking woman. "'The Urken Guard will have to drive them away. We don't have enough water to keep giving it to them. Let them go and dig their own wells.' "'But where?' Simon started to ask, then broke off, staring." Down at the end of one of the squatter town byways, he saw what seemed a familiar face. It had appeared for only a moment in a crowd, then disappeared, but he was sure it was that of the boy he had caught spying, the one who had left him to the wrath of the sexton Barnabas. It's that, that one I told you about, he hissed excitedly. Jeremiah looked back without comprehension. You know, Mal... Malachias. I owe him something. Simon reached the knot of people where he felt sure he had seen the spy's sharp-featured face. They were mostly women and young children, but a few older men stood among them, bent and withered like old trees. They had surrounded a young woman crouching on the ground before the opening to a half-tumbled hovel, which backed directly onto the stone of the great outwall. She held the pale body of a tiny child in her lap as she rocked herself from side to side, weeping. Malachias was nowhere in sight. Simon looked at the impassive, battered faces around him and then down at the crying woman. "'Is the child sick?' he asked someone next to him. "'I am, I am Dr. Morganis's apprentice. Should I go and fetch him?' An old woman turned her face up to him. Her eyes set in an intricate net of dirty wrinkles were as harsh and dark as a bird's. "'Get away from us, castle man,' she said and spat into the dirt. "'King's man! Just get away!' "'But I want to help,' Simon began when a strong hand gripped his elbow. "'Do what she says, lad.' It was a wiry old man with a matted beard. The look on his face was not unkind as he tugged Simon away from the circle. You can do not here, and people are bad angry. The child is dead. Go on with you. He gave Simon a gentle but firm push. Jeremiah was still standing in the same spot when Simon returned. The campfires all around outlined his worried expression in flickering light. Don't do that, Simon, he whined. I don't like it out here, especially after the sun has gone down. They looked at me like they hated me, Simon murmured, puzzled and upset. But Jeremiah was already hurrying ahead. And that's the end of that section, so I think that's the end of where we are going to wrap it up for tonight so <clears throat> uh thank you for bearing with me lovely to have been here um i hope you will all join me at the very latest same the same time slot next week but for those of you who have a little more flex in your schedule i will of course be reading at 7 p.m later this evening um, and as always, uh, I thank you so much for your presence and I, um, exhort you, I exhort you to take good care of yourselves, take good care of your loved ones, your friends and neighbors, the people around you who might need some help. Um, and as always, um, I feel fairly certain that if we all help each other, we will all muddy through. So again, pleasure to have you with me. I will... See you very soon. Y'all be good. Peace.